Hi everybody. After completely tearing apart four different large analog meters of different manufacturers and different types, we're going to have a look at one more here. And this is one of my favorites because it's because it works beautifully and it has very unique movement inside. It is an electrostatic voltmeter, completely different from the others because this one measures voltage directly as a voltage there's no current draw at least in DC we'll get into that soon there's no DC current draw with this thing whereas the others have to have at least a tiny amount of current for them to work to uh, send a, a needle pointing up on the scale because it needs a current going through a magnetic field this one is all electric field in here so this is Sensitive Research Instrument Corporation model ESD. Got 1% accuracy guarantee. There is even a temperature correction coefficient on this thing. And frequency range from DC up to 1 megahertz. And we'll have another look at that soon. Standardized by Lewis Miller on... We can see that in July 1st, 1954. And here's the, the front panel. Again, Sensitive Research Instrument Corporation, Mount Vernon, New York. And a very non-linear scale, up to 5 kilovolts. There's some other, other information there. And ranges, ESD, um, oh yeah, and capacity. 33 to 35 micro microfarad because they didn't have picofarad back then it was just micro microfarad so let's take this front cover off the top cover and we'll start taking out these screws now I'm not going to give this thing a complete tear down like I did the others because I really just want to maintain this thing in perfect working order and I have had this thing apart several times before. This screw right here is where the, um, the calibration seal used to be. And I've even wanted to do a video like this probably about two years ago when I was doing all my Tesla coil stuff. I even used this thing with a great big voltage divider network in a futile effort to try to measure the, the voltage on top of my Tesla coil. So let's pop the hood on this puppy and see what we got. Let's have a look at this first. Let's see, we got this nice aluminum foil shield all around the outside here. And again, we, we've already seen this before. This is just to, um, you know, prevent any kind of electrostatic uh, potential building up that could potentially affect the, the reading, attract the needle. Through electrostatic forces and that would be especially possible with something like this so here she is in all her glory nice and shiny stuff in here so if I move the needle right here you can see that the only moving part really is this one piece of aluminum in here that's got a couple of fin shapes on either side and you might think that that's the part to be energized to high voltage, but no, it's actually part of ground, or at least the, uh, the shield of the whole thing. You can see that it's got a metal shaft going from here down to the moving aluminum plate, and then continuing down to the bottom aluminum plate down there supporting the whole structure and that whole thing is right here on this wire going over to this terminal which is labeled low side or ground we got these nice insulating terminals here and I've hooked up already this this copper ring terminal which I cut out a slight portion of that ring so I can easily slide it on here and also wrapped up the uh, the end of it, which normally be crimped on a wire, but wrapped it up just just at the right diameter, so it can easily stick a banana jack into there. 
Now the terminal that does get energized, or at least should get energized, is the high side here on this clear plastic insulator. And that comes out through the box and hooked up to the two stationary plates just beneath the moving plate. So there's one plate right there and then it's got this nice looping wire going all the way around here to right there. So if you haven't guessed it already, this moving ground plate gets attracted to the stationary high voltage plates completely electrostatically. There's an electrostatic force that just pulls it ever so gently over that way across the range of the meter. Now one disadvantage of this kind of voltage measurement is that the scale is really non-linear. Up here in the middle of the scale we've got pretty good deflection of degrees per unit volt going into the device and even up here at the top of the scale we've got 5,000 volts and um, you know 4,000, 5,000 volts it's, it's a pretty decent scale up there. You can actually measure individual units um, down to, what is it, 50 volts. Each single line that you see here is 50 volts worth. But down here at the, the bottom end, we go from 0 to 1,000 in a matter of 2 millimeters. So really, really poor at low voltages. And that's simply because of the nature of electrostatic attraction with the physics going on here. The, uh, the force being applied to, to these plates, the torque, is proportional to the square of the voltage. So tiny amounts of voltage result in slightly larger squares of that voltage. But as you increase the voltage, then the square increases much, much faster faster and higher and of course that's going to give you a much greater force to overcome the the the, uh, the torque of the of the spring in there there's a good view of that uh, return helical spring now let's have a look at this capacity measurement here of 33 to 35 picofarads as measured back in 1954, 61 years ago. Now when I measured this thing with two different digital LCR meters, I got pretty much the same result of 12 picofarad, give or take half a picofarad or so, not that much of a difference. And that's going straight across these two terminals into the box. Doesn't matter what the polarity is because it's an AC measurement anyway and I got 12 picofarads and even if I gently move that needle either with my finger or with some kind of insulated plastic rod or anything like that it, it really varies anywhere from 11 to 12 picofarad regardless of where I put put the uh, the needle and the, the corresponding plates down here that's going to certainly change the capacitance but not by much, only by a picofarad or so. Even if I put the, the top plate back on top with this extra shielding in place, making contact with these four aluminum foils down here, then that's not going to affect it much either. Again, that might just add half a picofarad or so. Trust me, I measured it. It's really about on average we're looking at 12 picofarad for this thing no matter what the posi position is for the needle and this is not news to me I've actually made this measurement many times and many years before and we can show it with this Fluke 867B right now just with the, the probes hooked up to the input down here we've got 130 picofarad 120 130 picofarad 140 well that's just because I'm moving this thing around and it's becoming closer or further away from the the black lead here let me let it stabilize out maybe and we'll just plug it right back in here and there we go it jumped 10 picofarad up because that's the closest precision that it can get down to the 10 picofarad range not the one picofarad, but yeah, roughly, you know, 10, 12 picofarad 
that's how much we got here. Certainly not 30 to 35 picofarad. And for the longest time, I thought that there was some error in Lewis Miller's measurement back in 1954. But I think he knew what he was doing. And it's just a factor of age that has caused the capacitance of this thing to decrease. And I can show you why. Take this out. And that's because it's coated on the interior with all of this conductive paint or at least paint that must have been previously conductive because we do have these aluminum sheets right here and going into the screws but basically these aluminum sheets make contact on four points four corners here basically with the aluminum shield on the front cover and there's the matching four aluminum sheets right there just foils really just wrapped around and then painted over with this conductive paint and you can see that the paint comes down here to this to the the, the, the thick metal washers here for the the low side or ground input the high side is very thoroughly isolated from that we've got no conductive paint anywhere around there and then the paint continues up around there and basically all around the inside of the box. Unfortunately, this paint, after 61 years, is not quite as conductive as I assume it once was. So let's measure some resistance here. I'll plug this straight into the, the low side or the ground. I don't really have to hold it down. It's just, you know, touching the copper. That's going to be a low enough resistance compared to everything else right here because if I just touch it here there's nothing and I can touch it down here to the to the ring where this thing is connected there we go we got 0.15 ohms so clearly pretty good uh, connection with the, the black probe but touching the aluminum foil here touching the paint even touching the paint oops gotta be real careful oh what did I do oh man Got to be careful there. I just bent the needle down underneath the scale. Got to make sure that's still good. So I'm going to very carefully touch the paint just outside of the thick metal washer right there. And we still got nothing. I'm going to have to figure out what the maximum scale is on this thing. I see a 30 megohm right here i guess we're on the 30 megohm scale and we're certainly well in excess of that in resistance now i can even take the two probes here and just poke them right next to each other just a couple millimeters apart on the conductive paint and there we got pretty decent 44 ohms i'm surprised there stick it over here a little bit 76 ohms wow over here to the aluminum plate 97 ohms so the paint is quite conductive right there what about on this side huh look at that may as well be infinity you poke it even closer two kilo ohms one oh now they're just touching each other yeah it's just really really finicky here in some places well this is quite strange i've measured on this board right here and on this board right here and anywhere between the probe points is is uh on the order of hundreds of ohms tens or hundreds of ohms on this side and this side but on the other two sides on here and on here i can get you know Put them so close together, really jabbing the probes into the wood. Still in excess of what the ohm meter can actually read. Let me poke it down here on the bottom. Because we do have conductive paint on the bottom of the board. The bottom of the box. Still nothing. Well, anyway, I don't know why. But apparently time has been kinder to some parts of the shield than it has been to others. But ultimately... 
the whole shield is pretty much lost. There's really not much contact at all with the, the ground terminal here, and that would account for the much lower capacitance that I measured today than what was very likely measured back in 1954 with the 35 micro microfarads right there. So the 12 picofarad I measured today, that's just because of the, the plates down here, the active parts of the device, that's just the capacitance between them. 12 picofarad, and that's what I'm working with. And that's, that's fine. I mean, if I don't have any concerns for shielding, then lower capacitance on this thing is always going to be better because then I can measure higher frequencies of voltage higher frequencies of AC voltage that is. Remember we saw that it goes to one megahertz or back then it would have been cycles per second but they just put a little sinusoid symbol right there. Now if we do the 1 over 2 pi FC in this case 1 over 2 pi 60 hertz times 12 picofarad we get a impedance of 221 mega ohms and that's that's pretty good I mean typical DMM like this for most voltages is gonna have it's gonna have 10 mega ohm impedance if we increase to 1 kilohertz here then we get 13 mega ohms and that's also pretty good but if we go up to 1 megahertz then we're down to 13.26 kilo ohms and of course that'll be just fine for low impedance systems but if you have some very low current very high impedance voltage source that might be a problem by the way you may have noticed that on my trusty TI-89 I've got an M and a P in here that's just mega and pico 10 to the 6 and 10 to the negative 12 and that's just how I enter in my, my exponential information, or at least the most common exponent values that you would typically find in engineering. So I've got femto, giga, kilo. No, I don't bother with kilo. That's, that K is blank. But I do have mega, nano, pico, and micro right there for the U. So I just find it much easier to enter in the uh, the alphabetic character for for any given engineering multiplier rather than doing the exponent and then maybe the minus sign and then two other digits on here it's just easier to do alpha number and that's it you got it typed in okay got it put back together that's as far as i'm going to go with the tear down explanation of this thing I'm surprised that there's really not a whole lot of information out there, especially on YouTube. There's only a couple of videos where the, the people describe it just a little bit and how it works, but they don't go nearly in depth as I have done to tear the thing apart and explain how it works. So I hope this was quite helpful. If you learned something, please give this video a thumbs up. and. I've actually seen these things on eBay too. You can get something like this for about 50 to 100 bucks. Um, um, a, a sensitive Research Instrument Cor Corporation, that seems to be the dominant brand for these electrostatic voltmeters. And they've, you know, anywhere from the 50 to $500 range, depending on the type and the construction of it and how high the voltage it actually measures and just just how demanding demanding the seller actually is i think 500 bucks for any any of these things is a little bit overkill but that's that's what they're going for not this particular type i saw i saw one that went down as low as 300 volts so instead of five kilovolts it was a 300 volt full scale and of course that's going to have plates on the inside that are much closer to each other maybe only half a millimeter or so instead of a full centimeter or so that we saw in here and also they got higher voltages like 10 kV and 50 kV and various um, different constructions where 
instead of looking down on a needle pointing like this, you'd be looking sideways on a needle that moves in an arch like that. Completely different typologies. Have a look, see what's, see what's out there if you really want to get one of these. So I've decided to cut it off here. I've done tear down an explanation of how this thing works. In the next video, we're going to have a look at this thing in operation where we can compare it to this high voltage probe, um, just a voltage divider probe, 1000 to 1 voltage ratio when you have it hooked up to an ordinary DMM like this with a 10 mega ohm impedance. And we can also have a look at this handy dandy voltage divider network that I've created many years ago specifically for operation of this thing which only measures up to 5 kilovolts and with the, the voltage divider network of course we can measure much higher voltages than 5k. There are some advantages and disadvantages to this analog multi to this analog meter, electrostatic meter and we can have a look at those and just just compare how this thing um, paired with this thing and and um, see what's what's good and what's bad about it compared to modern day um, digital electrostatic meters that are on the market.